Right, many of these things have been planted in our house during the last few weeks. Seeds. And indeed, now there are lots of trays around the house where these seeds are producing shoots, green shoots. It's, it's exciting. And um, we're obviously hopeful and anticipate a good harvest later in the year. But it put me in mind of something that Jesus said about a grain of wheat being placed in the ground. He said, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Of course, Jesus was referring to his imminent death and resurrection. He paints a picture of a wheat seed being buried in the ground, then germinating and springing up out of the ground and producing many seeds. He was stating that only by his death, his burial and his resurrection could a great harvest of sinners be justified and reconciled to God. That's the only way this harvest was going to take place. So Jesus was teaching that the fruit of his ministry, that ministry which would bring men and women to God, could only take place through his death and resurrection. And this is so important. It's so important that we see it repeated time and time again in New Testament letters and sermons. And perhaps the best known of these is Paul's uh, exposition in 1 Corinthians 15, which is, I read some of earlier on. Paul tells us that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That means he meant the Old Testament scriptures, prophecies in the Old Testament, which should look in anticipation of what Jesus was going to do. And so Paul goes on uh, to tell us how Jesus appeared to Peter, then to the other disciples, at one time, 500, we gathered, appeared to James, and then to Paul himself. And Paul goes on to defend the gospel, the good news of Christ's res resurrection against the claims that um, he had not risen. I don't want to go into the details of why certain people in Corinth believe that, but there are still some people today who don't believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. But a significant verse is verse 20, when Paul says Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Hallelujah. But there's more. It goes on to say that Jesus is the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep, all who have died. In the Old Testament, the first crop of the year was dedicated to God and Christ's resurrection is the first of a great harvest of God's people who will be resurrected. The important thing is that you and I should be part of that resurrection. People sometimes have mistaken ideas about what happens when someone dies. The Bible does have clear teaching about this. Remember Jesus promised to the thief who was dying alongside him on the cross. The thief asked that he could be with Jesus when he came into his kingdom. And Jesus' reply was, yes, today you will be with me in paradise. From this we gain the belief that at death, our spirit will go to be with Jesus when that time comes for us to, to leave this earth. Our body goes to the ground, but our spirit goes to be with Jesus. For those who have put their trust in Jesus, that is, of course, heaven is where there'll be a consciousness of Christ's presence, a form of existence that will last until Jesus returns. And that's what Paul is referring to when he talks to those who have fallen asleep, those who have have left this earthly life at death and gone to be with Jesus. Paul writes of a bodily resurrection for the Christian when Jesus returns. He also refers to the planting of seeds, just as Jesus had done. In answer to the question of what sort of body 
will the Christian have at the resurrection? He states that uh, what you sow doesn't come to life unless it dies. He continues, when you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else, but God gives it a body. Now, this might seem all very mysterious and strange, and particularly when Paul refers to a spiritual body, uh, what exactly does he mean? Well, Paul talks about the dead being raised from the grave and those who are alive at Christ's return being instantly changed and being like, made like Jesus. In his letter to the Philippian church, Paul, writing in a similar vein, states that our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await uh, a saviour from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to go to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So we're going to have bodies like Jesus' resurrection body, is what Paul is saying. Now, writers have surmised uh, about the nature of this body. Uh, will we be recognisable? Will, will we appear to others to be the same age as when we died and all that sort of thing? Uh, we've got to trust God for these matters. What we can say is if he's gone to so much trouble uh, to make a way possible for us to enter heaven, uh, when we believe in Jesus as our saviour, then we are certainly able to trust him uh, to reconstitute our bodies in a form uh, which is suitable for heaven uh, when that time comes. Now, I began by asking uh, why the resurrection is, of Jesus is important. It's important because, as Paul points out, if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, then his preaching and mine would be uh, useless. It would be, be in vain. Uh, we'd have no forgiveness of sin. We'd have no prospect of change here in our earthly lives and no hope of an eternal hope, the home that Jesus promised. But as Paul and Peter, James and John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all together confirm in their writings, Jesus did rise from the dead. And countless millions have believed this to be the case in the 2000 or so years since the event took place. Belief brings change. And because Jesus rose from the dead, it means that he is alive. Unlike other religions whose founders are dead and buried, you can have a living relationship with Jesus. As the old hymn puts it, he walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. Because Jesus rose from the dead, death itself is nothing to fear. Paul again, quoting Isaiah, states that death has been swallowed up in victory. And he then quotes another Old Testament prophet, Hosea. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? And this assures the Christian that they have nothing to fear from death. And then Paul gives thanks. He says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then something that I hadn't noticed previously about this particular chapter, Paul rounds this part of his letter off with some further words of encouragement. He says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not vain. And then I read that in the New Living Translation, uh, or the la last verse, which really struck home to me, uh, which reads this way. You know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. The death and resurrection of Jesus bring forgiveness, bring meaning and purpose to our lives. The risen Lord brings hope and victory over, over death. So we say again with Paul, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ.